tap. Welcome back to MTGU, the Magic the Gathering podcast for you. I'm James. Addicted to the mannequin feet, I'm Blades. It's only after we've lost everything that we're free to do anything. I'm Rich. It's Saturday, the 4th of July, 2015. We're coming to you live from locations across Utah. Thanks for joining us. This is episode 64. Upkeep. All right, so as you heard there at the top, we have Blades and Rich on the line. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. A little sick today, but attempting it. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. I to- have a hard time enunciating words. I apologize. I'm glad to have him, and of course, Blades. Good to be have you back, Rich. It's been a long time. It's been six months, almost seven now. It's, it's been a long time. Yeah, I mean, we, we you and I chat from time to time, but we don't get a chance to actually to podcast. So this is nice. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I got. All Quite right. a bit of the main crew back together. Yeah, now we just need to try to get Damon on one of these days. We'll see if we can. We can do without him. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the news. Um, just a couple of things. Obviously, a lot of Origins news going on right now. Uh, the packaging has been announced. That's old news by this point. Um, I'll put links to this stuff in the show notes. Are they packaging it like... Uh, like, like what... What the origins packaging is going to look like and stuff oh, like that, oh, you know, boring okay. stuff, boring okay, stuff. Gotcha. But I it's, thought they were going to do the cardboard stuff, like it's like sweet. You mean like big cutout things? Oh, like the the Mar Masters booster packs were cardboard sleeves rather than plastic. Oh, okay. No, it's just yeah. they they just always put out an article that talks about you know what it the new stuff will look the, like, and I always like seeing that stuff. And at the time, it was interesting enough to put in the show notes but now it's old news anyway our, our the set's been fully spoiled and yep, so you and can go over there and I'll check have, out everything right now yeah and we have the the pre-release coming up in about about a week yeah on the uh the 11th 11th and yeah. 12th so that's i will pretty that's pretty fast i know it i'm gonna uh, be in new york so i'm not gonna make it You'd go to one in New York. Yeah, I guess I could try to find a New York place if the wife would be okay with that on our 20th anniversary to go draft. Go play magic. Magic. Go play magic. Hey, honey, love you. Happy anniversary. I'm going to go play magic. <laughs> Might not go hey, first, you so. gave her 20 years. She can give you three hours. <laughs> well, I don't know if she'd or see it that way. Or three hours. I, I, anyway. Uh, mechanics. It, yeah, so there's, there's been a few changes. It sounds like they're going to get, uh, not completely get rid of, but definitely diminish the amount of, uh, like, protection from colors, indestructible, regenerate, stuff like that in most of the sets. Because uh, they, they really want to make those cards that have those mechanics really shine. Uh huh. Um, and they're tired of printing things that say, you know, can't be regenerated or whatever like that. So they're trying to fix that. Uh huh. And uh, it looks like they brought back some other stuff. Like the uh, they brought back um, prowess was one of the mechanics. Yep, and prowess is showing a new mechanic called. Is it renown? Renown, renown, renown. and it it, it says renown. something like this: renown two, renown one. When this creature deals combat damage to a player, if it isn't renown, put uh put two one one counters on it, and it becomes renown. That reminds me of another mechanic, though. What which one was that? Uh. One that we had recently. In bolster? Not Bolster, but uh, like the, the other Abzan one. No, well, almost monstrous, really. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of like because a it becomes Because them, it but... becomes monstrous, remember? Yeah. And yeah, monstrous, monstrous was a thing. Luckily, this one, though, you know, the painting mana, you just get it for when it hits That's, somebody. Yeah, it. so there's that. Okay. So we have... We have Spell Mastery. Actually, I, I quite like Spell Mastery. We'll see how it plays out, but it looks interesting to me. What is Spell Mastery? Uh, if there are two or more instants or sorcery cards in your graveyard, those creatures don't untap. So what it is, it's it, every card's going to be a little bit different. Uh, for example, Fire Impulse, for one mana, it deals two damage to target creature. But if you have Spell Mastery, if there are two or more instant or sorcery cards in your graveyard, Fiery Impulse deals three damage to that creature instead. So it's basically, if an, it, in the way the lore would go, if 
this situation exists that you've cast instance of sorcery, then you've mastered enough magic that you get a bonus to it. It'll be interesting to see how that one plays out. What do you think on that? I think it's fine. I think it's very playable. It's something that I'm probably going to be doing quite a bit of since I'm more of the uh, spell-oriented mage than the creature. Mm -hmm. And the fiery impulse I was excited for until I noticed it said only creature and not creature yeah, player. It's yeah, not as good. Yeah, but I, 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 you know, they probably just nerfed it because it was too good that way. Yep. Menace. This uh, menace is like a, they actually added a keyword to it now. Uh, you know, there's lots of creatures that say like. Uh, can't be blocked unless it's by two or more creatures, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, and so now they finally named it Menace, so which is pretty cool. So it means like okay. it's going to shorten it up and make it oh, less okay. text on cards. So it, it's it's sort of an existing mechanic, mechanic that, that they've actually that they've key. given something to. That's nice. Right. Okay, yep. I like it. And Menace sort of fits that. And then of course Prowess, which I'd I'd just love to hear uh, Blades say that if I could. Prowess. Yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> Prowess, uh, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, this creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. And then, of course, Scry is back, which is cool. Uh, we, yeah, Scry is now actually evergreen. Yeah, which is... So, i see it, a lot it, more Scry here coming on. Well, it came back with such... You know, for a while it was forgotten, then it came back, and now it's just, yeah, kind of a staple. Yeah, and I think that it makes a lot of sense now, too, because, like, Wizard of the Coast basically was coming out and saying, you know, we're not going to use any more Serum Visions. We're trying to push away from, like, the Ponder, the Preordain effects, things like that. And a lot of, uh, specifically, blue players were pretty upset about that. And it makes sense now if they're going to just tack on Scry to a lot of the spells they're going to be producing from here on out. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, because yeah. now they're just, instead of having a whole card that just does that, they're going to add it to the cards you're going to be playing yeah. anyway, which yeah. is kind of cool, so... Which yeah. brings us to the next topic of conversation: new new Mulligan rules that are getting that are being tried out. Uh, either of you know much about this? Uh, uh, yeah. So it's not in pro. It's not. Yeah, it's not in process yet. But uh, here at the next upcoming Pro Tour, they're going to test out this new uh, Mulligan rule to where basic Mulligans. Uh, are pretty much just going to stay the same the way they are, except after you're done mulliganing, any player that uh, has less than seven cards in their opening hand uh, will then scry one to look at the top card and either push it or uh, keep it on top of their library. So it's going to uh, effectively, you're still down that one card if you say scry down to six, or if you mulligan down to six. But then you still have that slight little bit of an edge so that it, a lot of times you still keep questionable keeps and it just helps you through that even though you're down so many cards. So you're, even if you s mulligan down to th two or three or one, you only get to so scry, scry one. Them. You don't get a scry seven or anything like that. No. <laughs> right. It's always <laughs> a scry of one. Okay. So, yeah, and they're trading out in just the Pro Tour. Uh, it's probably because they're trying to see if it's even like worth doing and how long it'll take. I mean, Mulligan's now already taken the professional community, you know, five minutes to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't imagine scrying after each one. That might just make it more painstaking. You know? Do you get a scry after each one, though? Is that the thing? I th nope. Yeah. I think Only so. after you uh, keep your hand. Okay, let's make oh, sure. Oh, so you have to each, snap keep and then you get a scry? Each player draws a yep. number. Let me read this really quick and see. Each player draws a number of cards equal to his or her starting hand side, which is normally seven. Some effects can modify, blah, blah. A player who is dissatisfied with his or her initial hand may take a mulligan. First, the starting player. Uh, I'm going to keep going here. To take a mulligan, okay. Uh, where is the part? The key change. Uh, then, beginning with the starting player and proceeding in turn order, any player whose opening hand has fewer cards than his or her starting hand size scry one. So you're saying that you don't get to do it. You have to actually commit to that hand size. Yep. Before you scry. scry. That would make sense because yeah. that's just that too much. Way more sense. That's just too much information almost. Yeah, there's a lot of people arguing that it's going to give uh, Delver Secrets an advantage 
and I kind of call it BS because they're going to go down six cards anyway to be able to get this cry effect. Mm -hmm. So right. I don't I know. I think it's I, just I to like help it's out. It's going to help kind of speed the process <clears throat> along and kind of mitigate a lot of that variance. Some, it, yeah, a that. tiny bit. It'll, it'll give the variance just a little bit of an edge up to, to make it not quite so impactful. Right. Yeah. Right. Definitely. So uh, it's not going to affect us at FNM. You can start doing it with your friends, whatever, but yeah. it doesn't affect any REL except for the Pro Tour. Right? And, and then we'll see, I guess, from there how it takes. Right. Exactly. All right. And uh, one more news piece that we have here. Well, several more, but what's this one? Arena Planeswalker Battle Begins Now. What's this? So this is the uh, Magic the Gathering board game that they spoiled last fall. Okay. Uh they showed some images about it and everything, and now uh, apparently it's out and uh, available for purchase uh, at select locations. Um, oh, they have the like little Jace and action figures. Yeah, it's a lot like a HeroScape mixed with Magic, and that seems pretty pretty good actually. I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, they, from what I understand, uh, some of the retailers uh, had issues getting the product. So, uh, from what I've seen, it's on Amazon, and that's pretty much all that I've been able to find it. So, uh, if you can't find it at your local on uh, your local game store, uh, you might want to try online. It's possible at least Amazon for the next month or so. Have it yet either? They're just pre-selling, but yeah, but it sh could ship it after they get it, but. I'm just yeah, looking so up on Amazon it's right, out now. right now. Support local. Cough, cough. <laughs> you would love to support local if they had it, right? Oh, absolutely. Yep. It, honestly, would it, it might be just coming in with the shipments next week anyway. We hope. All the stuff for the pre-release and things. So that's probably what it is. With most distributors, rather than paying extra shipping costs, that might be why. So So when we get it and play it, we will. you will hear from us. Oh, absolutely! We yes. will talk about it on the show. Um, Keep your eye out for it. There's so. a, lastly in the news. There's some really big stuff that happened this week that uh, has some of the community up in arms. You want to talk about this, Rich? I don't know if you guys have heard, but there was a a player. His name is Zach Jesse, who had gotten a quote unquote permanent ban until 2049 from both Moto and Paper Magic because he was unsafe for the Magic community. Now. I'm not going to go into what his crime was. You guys can go and check out the Reddit post. I think it might have even gotten pulled now. You guys can just go check it out. And there's a lot There's a lot of different sides going on and stuff like that. And it sparked a lot of controversy in the Magic community. And I'm. it's hard to talk about it because, you know, you don't want to make you know, political suicide either. <laughs> but a lot of the pros are actually fighting against this right now from the sounds of it. Uh, because it's kind of unmitigated and unwarranted. But basically, uh, Zach Jesse, I guess, had gotten a felon about 10 years ago for a really, really, really terrible, heinous crime. Um, but since then, has been rehabilitated, you know, back in society doing his thing. And he was... Uh, Did he serve time? Yes, he served his time and stuff like that, yeah. But, so he was on a uh, Star City Games, I guess, Invitational or something like that. Somehow he got on stream. I don't remember where. Um, he made top eight of a large event. Yeah, right. And he got out, he was on a camera, and I guess somebody dug up into his past and find out about this crime that he had committed, and they, they just blew it and up. And it just blew, just up, blew up. up. And so Wizards, without any, like, I mean, he, as far as we know, like, I don't know if he was cheating or anything like that, but Wizards basically came in and said, hey, you're banned for till 2049 because, you know, so, you're let's... unsafe for the, the community and stuff like that. Go, you guys can go check it out for yourself if you want and make up your own opinion. It's a lot of gray area. Yeah. So there's a lot of gray area. Because there's a lot of unknowns, too, in it, isn't there? Right. Like, oh, we don't know all the facts. We don't know all the information. And yeah. it's just a lot of hearsay and a lot of stuff. But, yeah, go check it out. So Okay. It's been causing huge rifts in the, uh, the Magic community. And the only thing I'm really worried about is the fact that how... I guess my whole point in bringing this up is I'm a little worried as... Not even as a player or anything, but just somebody in the community... Um, watching this happen is how it happened kind of without any like precedent i mean yeah if they can just go around and start banning people because in fact of i past you know crimes. just just to, right just to bring things up there are people in the community i won't name any names but have criminal records but they have not been banned right right and a lot of those people like 
And some of them specifically, if if you know who we're talking about, have not come out and said anything because the fact of the matter is like they like and it doesn't matter if it was violent, non violent, whatever, but right. like, you know, it's are we gonna start getting when we hand out DCI numbers, are we gonna start doing background, background checks? Background checks, now? right. You know? Yeah. And now don't get me wrong, like if you're if you're in a sort community at your F and M and there's a, a sex offender there. You know what I mean? Who's not allowed to be next to schools, but can go play at F and M with a bunch of kids like that? I think that is kind of wrong. Um, I think it's a little messed up. But at the same time, like I, I'm not the law. I'm not Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. But I mean, where did we draw that line of uh, how much we're to check into people's background and stuff to go play? You know, this this card game, right? Um, and so it's just kind of a really big could be hitting national news soon with just controversy and stuff like that. So just kind of keep informed and. You know, if, if you're interested, go check it out. You can, I think, I don't think Wizards, Wizards have made, I think, one. Yeah, statement. I haven't seen much about it on Wizards. They haven't said a whole lot. Yeah. It's, and even Twitter, it blew up all day Thursday on Twitter, and it was silent Friday for the most part. Um, <laughs> I think that it just. Well, things like this do have a tendency to blow over, too. You know, you think about it. That's how, sort of how the news goes. Things right, will blow up to big. see what happens, because uh-huh. everybody kind of does realize it's a lot of hearsay, so they want to, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Burn Pete. It's a freaking witch hunt, you know. Yeah. So, all right, yeah, Any, check it out. Anything else in the news? No, just coming from a, coming from the uh, future felon over there. He's worried. <laughs> from me? Yeah. Oh, I'm super. I'm so worried. FFA future felons so, of America. <laughs> yep. Okay. okay. Uh, well, let's move along. Draw step. So today, up first on our draw deck, blades. So. This week I got Dismember, which is one colorless, uh, Phyrexian Black, Phyrexian Black. Uh, target creature gets negative five, negative five until on turn. And I've been playing this just as a singleton in modern. And I've actually been liking it for the format where five, um, negative five, negative five is really the uh, key uh, power and toughness for a lot of strategies with uh, Tassiger and the uh, Guramog Angler and Tarmogoyf list. I feel like this is pretty much playable in any deck right now. Uh, Taking the four damage uh, is pretty reasonable in so many different matchups against twin and such. It really just gives you that excess little bit that you need. And for just uh, colorless mana and four life, uh, it can really surprise people coming from the uh, singleton slot. Hmm. So I'm, I'm really on board with it. I like, I'm, playing it as a singleton in my geist list right now and uh it even though i can pay for life and then pay more for more and uh snapcaster it back i'm i'm pretty well invested into it i feel like it's pretty reasonable in the matchups that uh it can be uh the only ones that you don't really want it in is the aggressive matchups where the four life really does matter and i feel like as a singleton in those uh, either you're less likely to draw it, or even t- the times that you do draw it, it's not absolutely horrible. It's still eff- effectively bad, and you want to sideboard it out in your future matchups. But I, I just think that it's really well positioned in the current mo- modern metagame. Well, if you're going to get hit with a fish either way, take four or five, it's still, you know, at least you're getting it off the table rather than getting hit for five every turn. Yep. Exactly. Right. And it, yeah, like and like Blade said, it, the fact that it's you know a pseudo colorless, you could put it in any deck, which is pretty pretty good. So. Right. Cool. All right. So my card today is uh, one of the new spoilers, Sword of the Animist. Two colorless. It's a legendary artifact. Equipment. It's rare. Text says equipped creature gets plus one plus one whenever equipped creature attacks. You may search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library, equip two. So it costs four overall. You're going to be spending four mana, but only in two increments of two. So I'm, I'm keeping an eye on this. I think it might help with mana problems. It just looks kind of interesting to me. The design looks interesting, uh, helping you. And so you'll get at least one card out of it. I don't know if there's a way of making it, putting it in a deck where you could actually get more cards to get your mana out. Um, yeah, it's like the Explorer scope. The price you play in EDH. Uh, either that or uh, with Zendikar coming up as the next big set. Uh, Landfall is a pretty big mechanic and just lands, lots of lands as a whole in that set. 
If they continue the theme in something similar to that, this could prove to be a fairly effective uh, equipment. Okay, Rich, you're up next. Uh, my card today is Collected Company. Uh, it's three colors, one green for an instant that says, look at the top six cards of your library, put up to two creature cards with converted mana cost three or less from among them onto the battlefield. Put the rest in the bottom of your library in any order. So this card, if you know you guys have been paying attention to modern or standard, this card has kind of blown up a lot recently. Uh, everybody's claiming it's the new birthing pod and stuff like that, and there's been a lot of different kind of combinations. I mean, I've seen things from like the birthing pod list where they just replaced uh, birthing pod collector company to Naya Zoo, like Paul Ritzel's list, uh, to even like brews with like people are playing fish, playing merfolk. Splashing green for collected company or goblins, you know, splashing green for collected company, and you know this card's been really, really popular. And um, I've played against it. I've done a bunch of PPTQs here in the last six months, and I've I've played a lot of against collected company recently. And I don't, I'm not completely sold on the card. I think that it's very, very powerful. I think that it can do good things, but I've also seen a lot of times people go top six, you know, grab. A bird's a paradise, and that's it, you know. Or but I've also seen them go grab two lux on spiders, put eight power on board on turn three, you know. So it's kind of one of those things where it depends on how you build it, and it's not just something you just throw in because you have to build the deck accordingly. You have to put enough creatures that you'll actually won't whiff. They'll actually hit your creatures, you know. Um. So I don't know. This has been definitely on the radar for sure. It's it's gone from like three dollars to fifteen, eighteen, somewhere about that now. It's definitely up there. So if you got them and you're not looking to play them, maybe now's the time to get out of them, or maybe it's time to hold, you know, hunker down for some value. But I, th- I don't know. I personally think it's a terrible card. Um, that's just me, but that's just because I hate dealing with variants. I like to mitigate the, the amount of variants I play against as much as possible. And this just feels like, you know, hey, let's roll the dice, let's roll the bones, and see if we can get a six or a seven. You know. Mm. You know, uh, so. I, I would agree with that statement to where it is more of a gambling card, but if you put your, build your deck in a way to where majority of the time uh, the gamble is worth it if it's like 70% in your favor. Right. And I feel like the upside of this uh, potentially uh, is better than the downside of this. Granted, you are definitely going to have those times where you just brick and you get your Birds of Paradise, but I feel like if you build your deck to where you can offset that to our more times than not, you're going to get an upside of, like, two Kitchen Finks or uh, whatever else. Like, you can get six power of creatures onto the battlefield rather than just anything more than that. Right, for and it can generate minutes. a lot of card advantage. Um, yeah, I've seen at people- instant speed as well, so you can play around the Wrath as well. And it gives right. you that uh, accessibility of choosing between the top six cards rather than just a top few. I, I'm actually on the opposite end of the spectrum. I think that this is actually quite good. Uh, I'm looking to get some for an elves list that I'm putting together right now in modern, and that's I, I think it's actually quite playable, and I I think that it's not going to lower from its price tag of around $15 from now. If anything, it's probably going to steady, steady it around. Yeah, I think it'll just probably camp at 20 but and like what, I, what I'm getting at though is like I think it's really good, but the a lot of people have been building in the toolbox type decks, and it's no birthing pod. Like it's not a birthing pod. It's never you're, when you're trying to like oh maybe I'll collect a company and to find my my toolbox card I need. Like yeah, every blue moon you're gonna hit it, but sometimes you're just not to not going to you know. I feel like in the Abzan list that tries to do the Malire combo like. It's just like playing Birthing Pod. If you don't hit your combo, it kind of is rough. But you don't have the voice to search his beatdown plan as a backup. You're just kind of stuck with a bunch of three cover Mac House creatures. Um, and those are, there's a lot of people actually in the in the community playing um, Consume the Meek, which is a five-mana instant that destroys all creatures with CMC3 or less, specifically to combat against Collected Company right now. Because if everybody's playing Collected Company, you just play Consume the Meek the turn after, you wipe everything that you just went and grabbed. Now, the cool thing about Collect the Company, though, is like there's a lot of people playing Eternal Witness to buy it back, which is sweet, because I've had people cast Collect the Company on me four times in a row. That hurts. That's really tough to deal with. I mean, but that happens, right? Like, that's, again, part of that variance, you know? But I feel like where Collect the Company shines the best 
is in those like tribal type decks like goblins or fish or anything like that because instead of trying to find specific pieces you're just finding lords or even like the elves deck i think that the collected company in the elves deck is house it's really really good in that i just don't think it's very good in the abzan list as much like I understand that's the, that's the whole idea of building it, but I just I like it better in elves, fish, or goblins. I'm tend to uh, agree with you in that statement. Yes. So, but anyway, that's my card for today. Okay, uh, Peter's not with us today. He uh, is on vacation, but he was good enough to send us his card pick for the week. It's Monastery Swift Spear. It's one red for a uncommon creature, human monk. It's a one two. Has haste and prowess. Uh, and this is what he had to say about this. He says, I have chosen Monastery Swift, Swift Spear because I feel it's a symbol of how new cards can get assimilated well into an existing meta. Swift Spear is a popular card in standard decks right now. Haste and prowess are definitely huge, and this card can swing for damage on turn one. But it also uh, it's also popping up in other formats. Right now, Swift Spear is seeing play in Modern, Burn, and Zoo. I run a play set in my zoo, as, as a matter of fact, and it works great. And there's like even Swift some Spear. debate about Swift Spear replacing Goblin Guide in Blue-Red Delver in Legacy. It's, it's starting to see play in Legacy and Burn and stuff like that, too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely worth it. And I, for just a one red drop, one two haste, the toughness is probably extremely powerful to where it can... Uh, avoid a lot of the burn spells and a lot of your other opponents uh one drops where a lot of your opponents one drops are like a two two right now is like the uh high end of those i feel like that is uh quite reasonable and it's good on offense and it's good on defense okay main phase oh, i really wanted rich to say something there when i was playing that i just got used to that it's Nope, I'm going to mind my manners today. <laughs> okay, so today we're talking about uh, sideboarding for the metagame. Now, we've talked about sideboarding a couple of episodes in the past. One, I believe, was episode 10. Yep. And, uh, Blades, you said you went back and re-listened to that one just to check it out, and you felt like there was decent information there for someone that just wants some basics on, the, on uh, sideboarding. So if you feel like it, you can go back and listen to that. Another one was some specific sideboarding information that we did for one of the current metas. Um, I don't remember exactly which episode that was. But today we just want to kind of talk about what? Uh, sideboarding as whole, like just trying to predict your metagame and just more of a expansion onto uh, our episode 10 rather than the other episode where uh, it was... The other one was more of a sideboarding in that current metagame, which is now non-existent. So that episode is probably it's outdated. not worth listening yeah. to anymore. So, well, maybe the rest yeah, of the episode, maybe that, maybe there's parts of it that are worth listening to. Like so, my right now, we're, instead of focusing on specific cards, we're going to go for specific strategies that you can go for, and try to hope that this one is more uh, reusable in the future. Okay. So where do we start? So, uh, starting off at uh, building a new deck, uh, I think it's uh, good to go over the base spells that could help you out in the most common problematic scenarios, such as like artifact or enchantment removal, uh, any specific color hate that might be in your format. Uh, whenever you're, whatever your deck does not want to do, give it some outs to help it be able to survive what it can want to do. For instance, Dragon Sieges right now, the cons, the Fate Reforged, uh, those are pretty good because they let you uh, draw extra cards in your uh, aggressive red decks uh, just in case you're playing against a deck that is uh, wanting to go to the long game. That gives you outs in that scenario. Or uh, if you're playing more of a control deck, uh, it can give you more of like, the blockers that you need. So you can help get you to the late game. So it can help prevent your opponents from uh, doing what they want to do. So th those are some good ways to start out and some good areas that you can jump into. Uh, so after you have your base built, you should uh, write down your list and a base of the uh, expected decks in your metagame. How do you figure that out? How do you know, I guess just playing reps, what do you do? How do you figure out what uh, the big threats are? 
So in this one, I would say you uh, go to coverage and you search up what decks have been doing good. Like uh, in modern right now, we got Splinter Twin, we got Morfolk is at a high right now. Uh, Tron comes and goes every once in a while. Uh, Grixis is all over the place in different variants. Uh, Jund is really big at, on the high up. So if you yeah. can look at those and see what cards that are they are playing... And then you can somewhat get an estimate on what cards should be problematic for you. Uh, a lot of times you have no idea what is going to be what. Uh, that is where playtesting comes into play. And you really should do that. But that's going to come in uh, further down down the process. Rich, you, what, you've been playing a lot lately in, in some, some Lots of these of areas. Lots of modern. I don't, I don't, the last time I picked up standard cards was in Denver last weekend. And that's... And then before that was like six months. I haven't picked up standard in a long time, but I've been playing a lot, a lot of modern recently. And the meta has kind of changed quite a bit. Um, like Blade said, Jund is definitely on the rise. I see a lot of people playing Jund, and now they're actually switching out of Jund again because Jund just kills itself too fast. Are we talking like about game. standard or modern? modern? Modern, I modern. And then uh, Collect the Company is really big. Grixis, lots of Grixis. Everybody's splashing Tasker and everything, everything. So. Yeah, Tassigur is pretty much everywhere, so that's another reason why uh, I was big on Dismember. But, uh, yeah, so that's a good way to start out your uh, base sideboard. I have always been uh, pretty big on the writing down your sideboard and uh, getting your matchups out of the way. That way it gives you uh, a plan on what you can do in between games in the past. Uh, I've... I've always been pretty big on that, and I still suggest that we do it. And uh, for going forward, uh, it also gives you an idea on what is dead in your uh, current metagame so that you can tell if you really actually need the artifact or enchant removal or the uh, color hate. It also gives you an idea on, okay, this here is stuff that uh, I actually need to focus on. Like this Tarmogoyf is really giving my uh, world some hate, so I need to get some bigger removal spells for this. So that tells you uh, whether or not you need to put more uh, removal in your graveyard for the specific matchup or what. This also tells you how much can go into your deck, uh, how much dead cards are in your current main board. Uh, and just like any part of Magic, uh, sideboarding is a numbers game. It is important to identify how many dead cards you have in each different matchup and filling out the numbers accordingly. So after this, it should give you some insight into what cards can do some overlapping in different matchups as well. So when, you're, when you do your sideboarding, you're not just thinking through it in your head. You're actually writing these things down, looking at it on paper to help you out to look at each individual matchup, you know. And then do you just take the matchups you think are the most likely to come out and, and focus on those mostly? Right, that's anticipating your metagame. Yeah. Is effectively what that is. To where in some instances, like FNM, you can do this uh, quite a bit more easily since a lot of people just play a lot of the same lists mm. over and over again, uh, especially in modern. But uh, I find it a lot to be true in standard as well. But uh, this will let you know, okay, so there's actually a lot of people playing a lot of uh, red burn decks in my matchup. So I probably want to have a really good match. Uh, matchup against them at least sideboard if not mainboard as well mm -hmm. so that that's something to uh, think about when co coming into it it uh, helps you identify which deck you're going to be playing also uh, how much mainboard slots you have uh, devoted to it and then going into it how many dead cards you, you have coming into the matchup uh, pre-board and then post-board how much you actually have as well Helps you mitigate those results. Yeah, you want to cut a lot of the chafe in your main board that doesn't help out in the matchups. Absolutely. And right now, like with standard, I guess like uh, Tarka Red is probably one of the bigger decks, and uh, Abzan Aggro, Abzan Midrange, and then there's Esper Dragons. Um, that's what I keep hearing about from everybody and stuff. So I've been seeing a lot of play. I have some red, blue, green like aggro variants. So, I mean. And accordingly, if you're playing standard or looking to play your FM standard wise, but 
uh, yeah, and like like Blade said, a lot when you go to the F and M, it's pretty easy because you're like, oh, I know, you know, my buddy blah 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 is gonna be playing eight rack. I know my friend, dude bro, is gonna be playing burn or soul sisters. It's a lot easier to meta against those people at your F and M. So I would suggest definitely if you're gonna go to a PPTQ that's not at your home store, it might be like thirty minutes away or whatever, not to take the same sideboard you take to F and M. Uh, reevaluate. Go look at all of the big decks. Go to MTG Top Eight. Uh, go look at Star City Games. Look at the top eights there. Stuff like that. Kind of get a generalization. Even go look at the last GP or Pro Tour. Watch some of the coverage, and I'll show you a lot of what people are playing. Because it's as sad as it sounds, people don't have a whole lot of ideas on their own. I mean, yeah, you'll play against some homebrew decks every once in a while, you know. But a lot of people like to co cut copy lists, net decking wise, especially in modern. And so that can give you an idea of what people are playing, and you can just meta towards that. And sometimes it happens. Sometimes you're like, oh, if I play against that Grizzle Brand deck, I just die. That just happens sometimes. Like, you know, there's no way around it. So you just cross your fingers you don't play against the Grizzle Brand deck, you know. Uh, but if you can kind of try to find some things that help you against a lot of different matchups or even just things that may not necessarily help out but are a little bit better than whatever's in your main board, like Blaze was saying, you know, cut it out, they'll help out, so... I like Grizzle Brand deck, by the way. God, I <laughs> oh, I actually 100% agree. That got me a few weeks ago. But yeah. uh, I absolutely agree with everything that you said, where you're going to a... Un the difference is going from a known metagame to an unknown metagame, just to get the base of uh, what you just said and just implement it even more. I absolutely agree. So... Uh, so after you find the more uh, simple and uh, more easily identifiable cards that are just horrible in the matchup, uh, I also like to dig a little bit more deeper. And uh, it's also uh, important to uh, look for the other value that you can gain from removing cards that don't seem as horrible, but you can lose to a bit of value in certain matchups just to get that extra like 0.5% or 1% uh, to side those out and to side in something else that doesn't seem as good, but is still pretty good in whatever matchup. Like, a, for instance, a, I've been going to a core Firewalker that doesn't seem like he'd be good in a whole lot of matchups, but in a lot of instances, uh, especially post-board, they remove some of their removal, or you want to get in more creatures in, onto the board to deal in the earlier turns to try and get in more damage over time. Uh, I've been finding that uh, card to be dealing a lot of wraps to where normally you would think that it would just come in against like mono red. I've been finding it coming against uh, twin uh, quite a bit more just to try and uh, get that tempo advantage in a lot of matchups. So that's one that uh, is sort of like a hidden that you wouldn't think would be coming in because it falls pretty easily to like uh, twin and uh, other uh so I just feel like that's sort of like the hidden gem in your sideboard that could be coming in that you're actually missing over the long term. And I feel like it gives you that just a little bit higher of a extra value percentage that you'd be missing otherwise. And where I strongly feel like right now that Magic is a numbers game, that any sort of uh, percentage that you can get in any matchup you want to capitalize on. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times I've won games from Kentucky against Tron. It's so funny. I'll play Kentucky turn two and I'm like, okay, whatever. And like, okay, pay for your th pay for this, pay for that, pay for this, pay for your one call engines. Like, and then you just beat them to death with the two one. It's funny. Mm -hmm. And but the thing is that nobody thinks it's good against Tron, and it's not. It's terrible, but it's a whole lot better than like a Liliana the Veil, you know. So. So it's just that little extra bit that's given you. It's just right. enough of an advantage that it works. Right. A little bit shor shorter on my curve to provide enough threats early enough that when I can, I can sweep up with my siege rhinos later in the game. So. And maybe that's a key to sideboarding is that you're not just looking to... You're, you may not have like a perfect card that's just like, oh, this is the card I side in that's going to win me the game because it's just a total bomb against this matchup. Maybe it's like, well, this card is just enough better than the one I'm taking out that it might be the, the, the trick that I need. Exactly. James. Exactly. That is easily uh, overlooked in my, uh, in my mind. And I think it's always uh, good to uh, just think to yourself, it can always be better. 
-hmm. and good enough is not acceptable. Always look for that extra edge. Yeah, and I think maybe that's why a lot of people don't sideboard, is they're like, you know what, what's the use? I mean, I could put this in, but it's only a little bit better, so why go through all that bother? But the point is is that if you can get something that's going to be that slight bit more advantage in that other matchup, then why not? Right. It's like, every time I play against Infect, I always take Seedrano out. Seedrano is a powerful card, but in four mana in Infect, I die on turn three. I don't need Seedrano. They're just going to gum up my hand. Mm -hmm. So any like shorter, smaller things would be better than a four mana a guy that's going to sit my hand and I'm not going to cast because I need to cast spells. Good, good point. So it's not as all, it, and it's not always what you take out. I mean, what so you put in, it's maybe what you take out. Right. Huh. That, that's a wonderful example. Yeah. So. After we get to this point, I like to uh, test a deck as much as I can. Uh, test mostly boarded games to tell if you are making the best selection. Uh, you want to do a mixture of both, but I feel like you definitely want to do a majority of boarded games. That's something that people overlook quite a bit. Um, and then this here, it also tells you just whether you're not on the right uh, game plan or whether or not is actually worth it or not. Whether what you got in your sideboard is doing the trick well enough and effectively enough, or whether you need to start looking for something else and something that can be uh, more accessible to other matchups as well as this one. Whether or not that gives, it gives you the uh, percentage uh, in this one, or whether it takes away a little bit from this one, but it gives you a whole lot bigger in another matchup as a whole. Which this here is a lot of just trial and error, and really it really leads you to... Uh, to not know what it does all in your other matchups as well. So that leads us to our next thing, to our repeat the process. It, like this whole thing is you just want to just go back to the start and then just go through it again after every uh, change that you make. And then at the very end, you need to reassess uh, where you are in everything and if it is actually worth it and everything and then just repeat it again and just keep going through it and going through it and going through it. Wash, a lot of, repeat. A lot of sideboarding is based on your play style too. I mean, if you're a person that likes stompy creatures and you hate running instant sorceries, find creatures that do something similar to what you're trying to do with your instant sorceries. I mean, that's half the thing with like looking at deck lists. Whether it's standard, modern, legacy, doesn't matter. Like If you feel like you will not play that card because it just doesn't fit your play style, don't play it. Find something else that you like better, too. Mm -hmm. oh, and then, I, like Blade said, definitely play test it enough so you can feel comfortable sideboarding. And that's the thing, too. Like, I don't, I don't feel like sideboarding gets enough love. I mean, really, it's probably one of the most important things you can do in Magic. Mm -hmm. Period. And how many to, like, people just you know? ignore it? Right. Oh, absolutely. Everybody. And it it doesn't get too much coverage. It It's really like game breakers on what it does because you draw that one card... It makes a difference in so many different matchups. Hmm. I like your last two points here, Blade, too, that you've put. I don't know if you want me to just go over them a little bit, because I think I understand them. I like, uh, so when at the first of a format, you make the sideboard along with your uh, uh, deck, uh, but you should modify the sideboard as much, if not more, then uh, you do the, the deck. Right. You don't just build a sideboard at the start of a format and keep it unchanged. Right. Uh, you should modify it between every event, like every single event. More so than the deck, even. Yeah. yeah More I, so. I personally have not touched, I just barely, as of yesterday, or sorry, Thursday, changed my main board on my modern deck. I haven't touched it in six months. It's been uh -huh. the same main board. So it's the sideboard side is switched every week. It was different every week. Exactly. But my main board stayed the same. Like I, I was more worried about what cards we need in my sideboard than I was in my main board. And we'll get to your results here of, with that uh, here in a moment. But like uh, every time you ch make a change in the main board, though, you should be asking yourself, how does this affect my sideboard? Yeah, uh, this also yep, gives definitely. you a uh, a good go to if you go back to your list and see, okay, what. What, how many times was this coming out in different matchups and what was coming in for its place this will tell you okay so is this still doable can I still take this out in that same matchup is it still just really bad in that matchup or is this affecting that to where I no longer can bring in one more card in this matchup and I've actually just got an extra dead card in my sideboard yeah 
Okay. And, uh, I don't know if we're moving on next phase or not. But... Well, do you have anything else you want to I, finish up I with? To add. I don't know if Blaze is done. No, I'm done. That, that's... So, that's pretty much it. So, what you got? So, the one thing I would suggest, and I think, I don't know if we talked about episode 10, because it's been a long time since I've listened to it, but uh, I don't know what's helped me a lot recently is scouting the room. I'll take a piece of paper and a notepad, and I'll walk around the room, and I'll write down, like, guy in blue shirt playing fish. Guy in red shirt playing collect a company, or I call it, we call it Coco. I'm sure. Coco. Coco. Coco Puffs. Um, you know, so and so, you know, Bob is playing Junt, whatever. Mm. Or, you know, so and so's playing Atarka's Red, or Absan Mid Range, or whatever, you know. And so when I go into play against those players, I already know what they're playing. Mm-hmm. It's helped me in a lot because I'll, I'll I usually try to identify the, the bird players. Uh, so I don't go fetch shock. Thoughtseize against the burn player. I'll just go fetch the basic Thoughtseize instead, or whatever, and try to preserve my life till as much as possible, if at all. Or diamond cast the Thoughtseize, but uh, it helps me a lot knowing um, also what's in the meta, like what people are going to be playing in the tournament I'm participating in. And what I'll do is I'll actually have I have a little binder. It's called my I call it my maybe board, my maybe board. Uh, it's a lot of cards that I feel like are really really good in certain matchups, you know, across the modern format. And I'll go around the room and kind of take a quick uh, count, if you will, about what I think people are playing and stuff like that, or what I know people are playing. Um, and I'll write it down and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, you know, there's like two burn players in the whole deck, maybe the whole format. Maybe I'll need three kitchen fakes. Maybe I could do with two kitchen fakes in my sideboard, and I could add a, a choke because I see a lot of Grixis players here today, you know what I mean, or something. And try to, like, change it enough around so that... I get a little bit more of an edge over the course of the greater margin, the greater amount of you know decks being played, and so there's no point in you know packing five pieces of hate against Tron if there's one Tron player in the room. Like yeah, you'll win that one match, but it's one round out of a seven nine round tournament. That's not that's not a, you know mm-hmm. effective. But if there's like ten burn players in a thirty man format, then maybe you want to bring in as more burn stuff again than you would against a normal matchup or normal you know. Uh, tournament, so that's what I found. How would you How would you know that this is talking about beforehand? You just happen yeah. to know yeah. what like people I'll just show up thirty minutes, an hour early. Usually, when they say deck registration, registration starts a little earlier. Grab my piece of paper, pen, go around, just document what I see, stuff like that. I've got my my buddy Zach. Um, I'll, he'll he's the only guy that does it with me. I understand. Like I go with a bunch of people to these tournaments, and Zach's the only other one that does it with me. So we'll sh- we'll compare notes and stuff and. They'll be like, oh, hey, so and so's playing this. Okay, cool. Hey, this guy's just playing because this. Just like, because you see I know them. This is a bad matchup for you. Are they just like, doing against these pre-game guys, or this pre- guy you watch out for, you know, stuff like that. And which is totally fine. There's no rules against doing that. Mm-hmm. And also on the flip coin, on the flip side, um, those of you who go to tournaments, I suggest, you know, don't play test your deck in front of everybody when you're getting ready for the tournament. Maybe you should play test a different deck. Or play to a different deck. Yeah, and that's actually funny. I've had people do that. I'm like, I thought you were playing Burning. Yeah, I know I tricked you. I'm like, oh, whatever, okay. <laughs> um, but then also, don't when you're when you're filling out the deck list, like when you're done with it, you know, just try to be like kind of secretive with your cards. Don't make it too obvious what you're playing, because there's guys like me trolling the room trying to find out what you're playing. <laughs> so, um, as a tip for you on the flip side, right? But I think that definitely that kind of helps you. And that helps you find out the meta, you know, ahead of time. Because, you know, you could plan, you could do, you know, hours and hours and hours of training and, you know, watching YouTube videos, looking at deck lists, all hours and hours of, you know, studying for a tournament. And it could mean nothing if you show up to the tournament and not a single person was playing X deck that you did a bunch of research on. Right. So you need to just, you know, find out when you get there what they're playing, basically. So Uh, I know that's helped me a lot. Uh, yes, I actually do agree with this to a certain extent uh, for smaller formats. If it's like a uh, 10 to 15 GP. player uh, person a tournament, uh, as soon as it gets to around the number of 40, I think that uh, the numbers are getting a little bit saturated, and you can probably uh, start to wean off of this a little bit, uh, mostly because that's just too much information to keep track of. And cool. how many people do you actually get, like a total of 10 total? If I can get 15 people out of a 40-man tournament, that's 15 out of 40 people I know what they're playing. That That's 
I, I, w- I would assess that as about 30% of the metagame. But is that really enough to uh, modify your whole, all of your planning coming into it and just oh, yeah. doing all that? I think that that's a fair thing. But like do, another thing that you need to think about when doing that well, is how much time do you actually have to do it beforehand? If you only come in like a half an hour beforehand and you've already got your list, like if you are adept enough with your list that you have pre- prepared beforehand, then yeah, I agree. Go for it, and you can uh, remember, okay, I've got this coming in for this list, and I've got this coming in for this matchup. Uh, what can I actually shave in these positions? But I find a lot of the times you're not all that well adept at that, and there's a lot of times where you're, you're, you're going to be doing second this. Second-guess yourself. You're going to second-guess yourself, and you're what? going to uh, actually like ruin yourself in some other unseen matchups that you don't see in, at that current position. Like I can see it doing it for like a card here, or like two cards tops if you're really well adept at it, but like as a whole, I think that that could be uh, sabotaging yourself and your sideboard options for everything that I just put down here. Like this is the way that I go for my sideboarding, and I feel like going like it at it from that is do, straying away from uh, this one strategy a little bit. I'm not saying that it's wrong in any ways. Well, I'm sure you know, that it it's does. It's probably work something you. that you can try. Maybe that, that's what I think. That's what Rich, you're going to say is that this I would works like for to you. Reiterate a point. Like I said, there's a I do the maybe board thing to try to fix the matchups. Which, which with the maybe perfect, board, I am or, absolutely 100 percent on board with that. But what I'm getting at is to reiterate my point. This is not even like dealing with sideboarding per se, but. When you're walking around the room, you see what other people are playing. So when you sit across from them, you're like, oh, hey, I know they're playing X and X cards, probably. Maybe instead of using a Path to Exile on their Tarmogoyf, I'll use it on their Tassiger because they can abrupt decay their Tarmogoyf. So it's Stuff almost like the that. different... It, a lot it's, of it's just more knowing how to best use your spells. Even mainboard or cyborg doesn't matter. Most effective because now you're just getting that much more knowledge of what right, you're playing with right. in your deck. Oh, no, as far as that goes, I absolutely agree. It also helps you uh, know your uh, opening hand, what is more keepable in uh, a lot of matchups. I absolutely agree with that. Yep. I've kept a hand with three Inquisitions and a Thought Seize against Burn, and I completely kicked his butt because he had no Burn to kill me with. Because I knew he was playing Burn. If I was playing against anybody else, I would have mulliganed that because that's terrible against, like, Tron. I mean, yeah, I take out, I guess, all of their, their fixing, and then they still top deck and kill me with it, you know, but... So, like, yeah, that's my point, is it just helps oh, you kind of know... And those are just... Sh- more. Just more ways of diminishing the amount of variance. I, both both points are well taken. I think that that's a good strategy for not just sideboarding, but for j- play in general. The more information you have, the better. But I think Blades has a good point, too. Is sometimes you can kill yourself by second-guessing too much. And, right. and And so I think that you need to just keep those things balanced. Right. And that's right. what I'm saying. Like, yeah. it's Keep it in more mind. about just finding out who's there, and that's why it's a maybe board. Right. It's like, right. If you know your matchup is bad against burn, and you don't see burn players in the first fifteen, like people you look at, and then but there might be like ten in the last thirty. So like, it you want could be, just, but but you know I mean? it's about law of averages. And, you know. Law of averages would would indicate that that's probably not the case. Well, I uh, yeah right, but we live in a world where they like to. Prove what's wrong with that. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anyway, any any last any last comments before we move no, along? Like, with, with that, like in this last big uh, GP GPT GP GPTQ PPTQ. Yeah. Okay, uh, there yes. We go. Uh, that I played in. I uh, I had done my math on the last one, which was just a week ago, and just like a city down. And I felt pretty good about the metagame, and I'm like, okay, there's only X amount of affinity players, there's only, like, this, and uh, I I felt pretty good about the metagame, and I built my deck uh, around the metagame, and I went into it, and I actually uh, didn't do so well at that uh, PTQ, because it, I, went, I ended up 3-3, three and three, mostly because uh, I went into it, and I felt pretty good about the matchups that I was going to see. But the fact of the matter is that I did not see any of those matchups, and I actually just uh, fell into the uh, minority of uh, the percentages of what I was expecting to see. Uh, the format was uh, quite a bit what I was expecting, but uh, I actually just ran into that bad percentage, and that's another thing that uh, it happens. sometimes it happens, but it's important to identify when that's actually happening and when you're just lying to yourself. Right. Right, like... Nobody, especially at the Ogden tournament, nobody was expecting Gray to be playing Grizzlebrand. And that was a month and a half ago, before it was even hitting GP 
market. So, yeah, that one caught me. Oh my gosh, that was so funny. Uh, I'll get into that in a minute. Let's <laughs> let, let's move into combat. Uh, Here we go. Combat, combat phase. phase. Okay, so who's up first? Uh, you want to go first, Rich? Yeah, Rich, you've been sure. doing a lot lately. I've done a lot. So I think last time uh, I was on was December. Yeah. Something. I think I, I made the statement that I uh, there was two things going to happen with me and Magic. Either I was going to go push off to the casual side, just step away from the table, or I was going to go and I would get her done and try to play as much competitive Magic as I can and try to see where I can get. Um, a couple weeks later, like my first PPTQ I went to with the new PPTQ uh, system, uh, I ended up taking the PPTQ. Got invited to the RPTQ, which was here. We had one here in uh, Salt Lake. It was in the West Valley area. Uh, epic. Went to that. Did kind of terrible. Got like Mike Flores was there. I think he even wrote an article about the meta here in, in Utah and just how much he liked it at this at this certain venue and stuff like that. Um, but I went three three. Uh, it was standard, and again I hadn't played standard in a long time, and I was playing Abzan aggro, and I was definitely, and that's the thing, I was sideboarding, meditating towards playing against other abs and aggro decks. I think I played two, even though it was 50% of the meta there. So I just, I, I ended up being an Asper player who did go to Pro Tour. I was his only loss the entire day. It, that was round one. And then just did do so hot after that. I lost to like a rug deck, lost to the Bant uh, Morph Death Miss Raptor deck with Master of the Unseen. And I lost to a rug aggro deck and something else I can't remember but anyway so 3 I want 3-3 three, three. so that did, did do too great but for my first PPT, RPTQ I felt like that was okay it was a pretty good finish um, and since then I've been 5 for 6 for M- PPTQ top 8's uh, I went last weekend to the RPTQ the regional pro tour qualifier in Denver I took 12th it was sealed gosh I hate sealed so much uh, Absolutely anyway. agree. Hate it. Um, my deck had a Death Miss Raptor in it. It secured the waste. It was pretty solid, but the guy that I, I lost to that would have probably pushed me into going top eight was playing the War Aspirant guys. The two ones that it was, it has the Ash Mouth ability that whenever you block it, it deals one damage to whatever creature is blocking it. And I had a secure the waste in my hand. Go figure, right? So, like, I was drawing nothing. So he just killed me with two of those guys. Um, but I ended up going five two, taking twelfth. Uh, so really close to going top eight. I was so and, close. And and you and and you made enough to pay for the flight. Right. Yeah. And I ended up like I drove. Eight oh, hour drive. You, with my to buddy pay Brandon. for the drive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, was, which is hey, I mean, if you can even do that well, that's that's good. Right. That's good. Which I wouldn't be able to do in my Jeep. I actually bought a new car last week too. Oh, so cool. Um, I'm not, I'm not driving that POS. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually getting you know. Said twelve miles to the gallon, being you know twenty four to thirty, which is nice. But nice. Um, so yeah, so I've, done, I've done, gotten into a lot of a lot of top eights. I mean, I don't. And that's the thing. I don't really get to play a whole lot of modern. Um, out of the last, I've died to infect like four times for whatever in top eight. Like that's the deck that keeps killing me. So I'm getting to the point now where. You know, damn it all to hell. I'm just going to play more Infect Hate, whether I lose or not against other matchups, because if I do get top 8, I need to hedge my bets against playing Infect, because I keep dying to it in top 8, which is weird, because I'm playing Junk, but they always just seem to have, like, the right cards at the right time, or just the right amount of stuff. Like, they're like, Spellskite, Spellskite, and I just can't, you know what I mean? Don't rip the Maelstrom Pulse or whatever. So, but, yeah, I've been doing, and the thing is, all the people I've done is modern. I haven't done any other ones, because I don't care to play standard or sealed so um you think yeah, so you think anything is going to change that you think there's going to be times when zendikar's coming up what do you think is that going to uh, change your opinion probably not <laughs> school is a thing um and that's a part of the reason why i've been able to go to so many more pptqs is it's summer i'm not in summer semester this semester mm-hmm. so um but this fall like i might be going to denver in no oh sorry not denver Seattle in November for Legacy. Never really played a whole lot of Legacy. It just sounds like fun, and I kind of want to go. Um, but I'm thinking about going to play some more Grand Prix and start putting some time and money aside to go traveling. Nice. Because um, it's been fun. Went to GP Vegas. That was awesome. Uh, the group I went with, we had like eight or nine guys. Uh, we just rented out like a house and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. Um, 
I am going 3-3 three, three as well. That's apparently my, my modus operatus whenever I go to big tournaments. <laughs> but uh, um, my, one of my buddies ended up pulling three goifs over the course of the weekend. Lucky SOB. But um, we had three guys, uh, Joey uh, from the Layton store, um, and then John and Dan. They, they lost their winning in. They were X2 going into, you know, day two. They were almost went day two, basically, what I mean. Um, we ended up just going to Vegas, having a good time. It was a lot of fun, so. I uh, got to meet Marshall Sutcliffe, saw LSV, uh, Calvin ended up beating uh, Ben Stark, which was pretty funny. One of the pros from Channel Fireball. Got to meet a lot of pros and stuff. It was a lot of fun. Um, got some more foils for my deck. I'm like 10 out of 75 now, foil for my modern deck. I've, yeah, just trading like a boss. But so yeah, that's kind of what I've been up to. Um, just trying to like stay active in the in the I guess pro circuit in that's Utah, awesome. but it's not really a pro circuit because semi pro circuit Utah. But <laughs> yeah, the semi circuit. Trying to like trying to just get out there and get going and things like that, and been doing some work and hopefully I might be going to a PPTQ tomorrow unless I go swimming or boating. But um, well, we're cheering for I you. Try to go for that. That's another modern one. So. Uh, but yeah, that's what I've been up to. Lots of fun. Been playing Abzan mid range. It's a really, really good deck. I feel like it's better than Jund. Everybody started playing Jund because I think Todd Nelson started streaming it again or something like that. So there's a lot of players playing Jund now. Cause like, oh, this deck's really good, and I feel like Abzan just eats it for breakfast still. And I think Abzan's still just one of the better decks in the format right now because it's proactive enough to be able to deal with all the combo decks like Twin and. Amulet, Bloom, and stuff like that. And it has the big removal spells that you need for those decks, but also has enough inevitability to the game that you can just close it out with Siege Rhinos or Tarmogoyfs. So, but that's what I've been up to. I don't Amazing. Know if you have any questions or anything? I think I'm more inclined to say to be on the Abzan train rather than the Jun train. Uh, I'm a little bit on the outside coming in from uh, the American player here, but uh, I, I think I'm with you there. Yeah. There's a lot of people saying Scape Shift's really good right now. I anyway, I don't I don't know what to say about that other than just kind of laugh and snort in derision. But <laughs> anyway, that's that's a local thing, and I'm not gonna get into it. But um, I, I'm the same way with Merfolk. Right, yeah, I play against so much fish. You know what's really good against fish? Everything. My MVP. You know what my MVP is against fish? What? Ghost Quarter. <laughs> that has won me more games against fish than any other deck because they're like spreading seize your overgrown tomb. You're like, okay, and like attack, unblockable, ha ha. And like ghost quarter my land. Now they're on, now they're not unblockable anymore. Block, kill all of your guys. Okay, can I proceed to kill you now? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't. It's weird, but um, but yeah, going back to the Grizzle Brand deck. So like, I just have to do this. Like, and if Ray listens to this podcast, he'll maybe appreciate it. But my buddy Ray um, played the Grizzle, the Grizz Shoal brand deck here at the Ogden PPTQ about three months ago and stuff like that. And it was before GP Charlotte and GP Singapore and stuff like that were started getting more steam. Um, and I guess he pulled it off the list off of Reddit or something. I don't know. But it was just funny to watch because it was before everybody was on that bandwagon for it, you know? Mm-hmm. And so yeah, he he took that that tournament by storm, and he had dying in fact top eight go figure. Um, but it's just funny that that deck's that popular right now. Like I think uh, Goro's Vengeance jumped from like a two dollar card to twenty, and I think it's still close to, like fifteen or eighteen bucks, maybe twenty twenty five. Uh, it's it's actually up to forty fifty. Wow. What? Yep. What? Why? That deck is so bad. It dies to ensnaring bridge. Like, I mean, the Grizzle, the Grizz Shoal brand, not so much, but because you, you can just do the Borborigmos, you know, kill you out that way type shenanigans, but that's so bad. Uh, it's a mixture Ugh. of things of not being reprinted in any other uh, set, and it's also uh, the flavor of the month, So, and we're also in modern season, so uh, it's probably yeah. being hit by the same thing as to why Snapcaster is close to $100 right now. Right, well, they're, they're finally dropping, you can get them on eBay for 60 to 70 but um, well, like, so I'm gonna say this, bear with me, James, if you feel like this is... I'm listening. Too rude, you can cut it out, but it was really funny, so there's this guy, names will not be named, 
and he does a podcast that I will not name in from a different location, different store. And uh, it was funny because he com- he kind of backhanded complimented uh, my buddy, my buddy Ray, about it because he's like, "Hey, you know, like I feel like this guy broke the meta by playing this Grishel Brand deck." You know, this was of course three months ago, um, but it was funny because he's playing Scape Shift uh, as Gray's opponent is. And he ends up cryptic commanding, bouncing back the the ley line of sanctity back to his hands, and he's like, you know, nice trade, like recasting that, whatever. And so Ray just untapped and metamorphosed to add two white to recast it and stuff like that. It's just funny because like I've seen him in response to people like like Splinter Twin player goes infinite light, it goes infinite, right? Makes infinite guys, and in response kills him on the spot with the Grizzle Brand deck because it's just so modal when you can do things, but. Now that it's on the hate list, it's just like Dredge and Ju- and uh, sorry Dredge and Legacy. Now everybody's just gonna be packing graveyard hate for it, you know. But it's just funny to me that that's just a deck right now. It's so- oh, absolutely. The instant speed is just out of nowhere. Like he he definitely caught me with the instant speed. To where he's, he has like two mana up, and I'm like, yeah. okay, end of turn, click you, and he's like, okay, instant speed. I'll just go off. I'll just go off and through the breach this nice little Borborygmos and kill you with it yeah yeah it's funny but uh i'm trying to think what else i don't know oh and if those of you in denver if you haven't been to enchanted grounds the owner is an awesome guy like that's a really i like that store a lot it's really cool so they have coffee and stuff it's awesome go check it out i have two locations now there's open a new one so shout out to enchanted grounds for holding an amazing uh rptq last weekend but all right Blades, what are you up to? So, I've been almost all on the modern wagon right now, too. Uh, standard, I'm just not all that into standard right now, especially with it rotating here or getting the new set uh, here within the next few weeks. But uh, I, I actually uh, start off by uh, adding step links to my uh, Geist list. Uh, Why? Because it it's seems aggro. so bad. You know, it actually seems so bad, but what I've... Uh, found out is uh, that the converted mana cost of a lot of the spells in it is like around 3 or 4 and a lot of the lists that they're doing right now are, are keeping it that way they're starting to add cryptic commands which I don't really think is a good idea uh, especially to where I'm taking it uh, I think step links is a pretty good uh, falter to go to because uh, the 1 damage spells aren't seeing a whole lot of play outside of uh, the slower ones like uh, Electrolyze uh, so you're able to still get in a few beats here and there out of them, and really, Electrolyze is already good against their Snapcasters and everything as it is. Uh, Snapcasters, V-Clicks, and everything, so that card already is just pretty good against the deck. But what I was just looking for is just to uh, make it a little bit less clunky on the mana base, make it a little bit more aggro and low to the ground. Uh, your late game is definitely going to suffer from it because you're taking out a lot of your uh, late stuff from what I've done. But I'm I'm actually on board with it. Uh, so I've I've been finding that uh, it's been a whole lot more cohesive in, in this build. Uh, you're able to play things uh, around and have more options at all other times. Uh, I I just really like uh, resolving a step links and then keeping up remand rather than uh, just holding like bolting somebody and then holding up remand. I feel like you get more value out of it that way. So Remand uh, gains a bit more value in the list. Uh, some, same with a lot of your removal spells to where you, you just resolve the links and then you're still like fetching your lands to uh, deal the damage and then removing their guys out of the way, which you're going to be doing to get your guys through anyway. Uh, so I feel like it just gets a whole lot more value that way. Uh, you're playing more fetch lands, so your land base is a little bit more tight. But even with that, I feel like uh, you're less mana intensive to where most of your spells in there only cost like the the one color of what it is outside of a Vendelian click. You're not playing like duplicates of a lot of things unless you're like uh, playing a bolt and then snapping a bolt back in the same turn uh, or like two lightning helixes in the same turn. Other than that, like you have a lot of flexibility with your mana. So you can uh, you're, you're searching a lot less for these shock lands. And which is a good thing when you're playing step links because then a step links in a flash deck uh, to where then you can search for your basics and it doesn't punish you nearly as much unless it's an island. 
So I've been uh, shifting it a little bit more towards that way, and I've actually been finding uh, quite a bit of success with it. I'm like 100% on board. It also, uh, when you get to your late game, uh, you normally have a choice of either casting a spell or activating your colonnade. And I feel like colonnade is uh, utilized a bit more in this deck in the earlier turns, uh, where I'm trying to take it, and a lot of times I feel like where I'm being more aggro in the early turns, uh, Colonnade on turn 6 is actually very reasonable to do just to get through that extra damage. And you're already playing that, ex that high mana count of 25 anyway to help with step links, uh, also to get to your Colonnade, and it, uh, it just doesn't feel bad to me at all. Like I feel like it's where the deck wants to be, and I was actually talking to a, a few of the uh, Team Guys people, people uh, Scotty Mac and uh, Real Evil Genius. I was uh, I just made the comment of, hey, what do you guys think about Step Links uh, on their stream the uh, earlier this week? And they're like, oh, I hate it, I hate it, it's terrible, and this and that. And I'm I'm over here like, oh, really? Because uh, I'm actually like, I'm I'm invested into it. Like I'm I like Step Links. It seems unconventional, but I'm. I'm actually on board. Huh. So call me crazy, <laughs> or call I, I me maybe. I think it's hot garbage, but I mean, <laughs> if you like it, fair enough, I guess. That's what yeah, this well, game's I think about. Your haircut is hot garbage. It is very hot garbage. <laughs> Got shag going on, but I don't know, man. Like that's the whole point of like the the geist list is to temple your opponent out while burning them in the face. I feel like step links when you top deck it late game you just lose, right? Oh, like, I agree. He, so uh, late game he he's definitely not good, but like early game turn one step links it's it feels so good and people they were. What also, do you do about lingering souls? They just go lingering souls. You just your step links is like oh, hey guys. Lingering souls is already an issue for the deck. Lingering souls, like links, but on on a plus right now, as of right now, where we're seeing more Jund as far as Abzan uh, in the next few weeks, that is likely to change or maybe changing. Uh, I I'm I'm not seeing a whole lot of lingering souls. Uh, I I don't play lingering souls. I think it's it's okay. It's it's really really good. I like lingering souls. I just I don't play it personally. I like other stuff better. But which yeah, I don't know, dude. Like. Fair enough, I guess. Because you go, because you go step links. So let's say you're like, hey, like playing step links go, and there's like John is like bolt. You're like okay, Abrupt well, decay. if they have oh, it, they have it for a turn one drop. Mean. Bolt is gonna kill just about anything anyway. Well, like, in response to the there, there's nothing on that stack, you can do. Bolt your step links. Yeah, yeah, that's still possible, and that's still something. But really, that's. I'm finding more and more that that's if they have it they have it anyway and there's nothing that you can do about it but if they don't have anything like that and they can't hold it up for a lot of your other evasive uh, guys whether it be your snapcaster or whatever else uh, it also makes it good better against Lil Liliana as well since uh, Liliana and your guys like that's pretty much a huge crutch crush for the deck and uh, it makes them waste a lot of their removal on other things that uh, they really need to, like, Step Links really needs to be answered, because if it goes by unanswered, it's like, uh, it's like a turn early goif in a lot of situations. Granted, a lot of times you don't get there, and he is still a little bit of a gamble, but yeah, I, 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 I'm on board with him, and I think he's worth it. Fair enough. It also gives it. you a better game against G Blood Moon, which is uh, potentially bad against oh, that, or good Moon. against that deck, because you're, you're fetching more basics effectively. Like sixty or seventy bucks now, what blood moons? It's crazy, it's so cray cray. Yeah, oh, I met a guy from uh, Jackson Hole who played a Steplinks deck with Scape Shift. So I mean, there's definitely a market out there for him. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that like seems it, that's fair. that seems a little bit more uh, advantageous than what I would be looking for. But that Lequeries and stuff too. So like, you just made big, huge creatures with, you know. Land fall and stuff like that. Also, not that it needed it, but Ghost Quarter, it, it still gains a, like a 0.1% advantage off of Ghost Quarter because a lot of times you just Ghost Quarter yourself. And I, I'm just all in on Ghost Quarter. Like, I love that card so much right now. It's pretty good. I have a hard time. I keep wanting to cut one. I'm running three. I want to cut another one and go to two. 
And then you win that game with the ghost quarters, and then you forget how much you like it. Like, I've been ghost quarting against Burn, like, because they're not running any basic planes or forests, so you just ghost quarter out the, like, you know, it's funny. I've locked so many Burn players out with ghost quarters. It's so good right now. I I agree. Yeah. But. So, huh. Geist. Hashtag Team Geist. I'm, I still find it funny that they, they kept the name Team Geist. That makes me happy. Yeah. So, what have you been up to, James? Oh, thanks for asking. Uh, I might need. Uh, I might need. Uh, uh, what? What's the? What's a? Uh, an intervention. I've been playing a lot of Hex. How is it? It's awesome, actually. I want to write. I'm going to write an article for the website that talks about what Magic can learn from Hex, because I think for newer players, it, it's a much more engaging program than moto uh sure. the the its ability to uh it i believe that its uh ability to play against the computer and then transition you to playing against real life people is far superior to what moto can give and so i think that it's 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 a le- little less intimidating i also the AI is more intelligent yeah and Frankly, I'm hating. I've decided I hate uh, Duels of the Planeswalkers. I know that I've been a proponent for a long time, but I've finally come to the. So now that I've played Hex, I'm finally like, you know what? This is garbage. Yeah. I, I, it, it is because. Oh, I, I, it'll come out in the article. I have some thoughts. I'm going to write an article about it. Um, I've just been. I've been drafting on Hex, uh, live drafting. Um, I actually won a game yesterday. <laughs> Sweet. I, I think what, what I need to do is just start live drafting on Moto as well. And I think by doing it, it will make me more comfortable with it. It's just that I just feel like the learning curve on Hex is lower. Anyway. So, so with the uh, Magic the Gathering uh, Steam game, what, oh, Duels of the Planeswalkers, yeah. I don't think that it's, just a, that it's a bad game by any means. I think it's just that people outgrow it fairly quickly. Well, here's what I don't like about it. And I, I don't want. I'll give it away. I'll tell you what's in my, what's going to be in the article. But just give us the thesis. I'll, I will. I will. I'm I wrote it down here. Morrow, Morrow said, "This is what he said. If players always know exactly what's going to happen and the ordering in which it's going to happen, the game is no surprise, and that's a problem." Well, guess what? That's exactly what happens in Magic: Duels of the Planeswalkers because. You always know that, first of all, the computer always has a perfect draw. And you always know what they're going to play against you. And they always have that perfect hand. And that bugs me. The, there has to be variance to make it fun. And losing that variance makes it so you're like, oh, I just got screwed. And there's no way I'm going to beat the computer now. Because they the always have a perfect, what's that? So I think the older ones had more variants. They, the new and, ones, they, they try to like. They have gotten rid of it. it and more I, interactive. Yeah, it's just it's just stupid to me that they've taken all the interaction out of it. Maybe this new one that comes out here this month will have something that will intrigue me. I'll probably go ahead and get it just to try out. It's supposed to be free to play, so we'll see. Anyway, I I want to play more Magic. I intend on playing more Magic as opposed to Hex, but it's just that when I sit down at my computer, I'm like, Magic. Magic Hex. Hex. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully this doesn't turn into the Hex podcast. <laughs> it does. I guess it does. But <laughs> I don't think it, it's not going to. I love Magic. Uh, don't get me wrong. It's just that uh, it can Sometimes learn. you need a break. Yeah. No, Sometimes Magic can break. actually, Magic, instead of suing these guys, needs to learn a few lessons from them. They could actually learn some things. So... But it's Hasbro, and Hasbro knows everything. Yeah. Has- Hasbro knows best. Yeah. <laughs> so. What would Hasbro do? I don't know. Yeah, what would Hasbro do? <laughs> WWHD. Okay, anyway, that's all I have. What about uh, for my combat, combat phase? Um, let's move along. Second main phase. So in our second main phase, here we are. Uh, I don't have any email feedback this week. Um, no new iTunes reviews, guys. Get some iTunes reviews into us. We'd love to get some more iTunes reviews. Now that we're back, 
we have a, a contest that will be coming up. I think I'm going to do. Uh, I think we're going to do another Zoom contest soon. Uh, I forgot about those. Do you remember that? I think those yeah, are fun. I thought you said Zoom. And I'm like, why are we giving away a Zoom? I feel like if we hand, hand them like... <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give away an old Zoom. dog crap. <laughs> exactly. Than I'm going to give away a handful of old MP3 players that I have. <laughs> right. That's what I thought you said. <laughs> um, we do have a poll up. I, I only have three responses. Here is the poll of the week. Uh, the poll of the every few weeks. We've been gone so long. Have you missed us? There's four options, plus you could write in something if you really wanted to. Yes, like I miss the air I breathe. Yes, but somehow I managed. No, oh, not really, but don't ever leave again. Or, no, shut up and talk. Now shut up and talk. <laughs> or you can put in your own comment there. So go to the website, leave, leave uh, participate in that poll. It'll, I'll leave it up for another couple of weeks just so I can actually get some real things some real responses, and uh, not that the ones that are on there aren't real responses. One of them, I, I, I did respond just to test it out. So let me get back to my show notes here. Um, that's, that's all I can think of. Do you guys have anything else for your first main, main phase? You want to cast anything? You want to? Uh, okay. No, I'm good. We'll pass nope. priority. All right. Here we go. End step. If you like the show, you can leave us a five-star review on iTunes. If you don't like the show, feel free to contact us directly. You can email us at mtgupodcast at gmail.com. We have other content on the website besides the podcast, so you can check that out. Go to mtgu.com. Subscribe and like us on YouTube. Find us at youtube.com slash themtgu. Follow us on Twitter at themtgu. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash mtgu. And, of course, we're also on Stitcher. So, for the MTGU podcast... I'm Blades. I'm Rich. (laughs) I'm James. Now we pass the turn to you. Make me want to punch me in the face. Oh yeah, keep it up. I don't know, but with a butt like that, I can see why. I'm more of an ear man myself.